Until the 15th century, urban settlements were established near administrative centers, which were viceroy's castles. The ruler received income from free craftsmen and merchants who lived near the castle. They paid market taxes and trade duties. The rapidly growing state needed many highly qualified craftsmen. Gediminas made it part of the state policy to invite merchants and craftsmen to Lithuania. In his letters to the masters of the Hanseatic League, written in 1323, Gediminas revealed his original program of development of the state's economy. He invited to Lithuania warriors, knights, merchants, craftsmen, blacksmiths, wheelwrights, shoemakers, furriers, millers, masons, goldsmiths, masters of war machines, and others. The new arrivals were promised to be provided with land and to be temporarily exempt from taxes and duties. The level of crafts and trade achieved determined the origin of Lithuanian towns. As Grand Duke Stefan Batori noted, the nobility was the ring on the nation's finger and towns were the pearl in that ring. A feudal town united personally free business people. Hence its development was closely related to administrative and legal self-government to the towns becoming collective vassals of the rulers or large seigneurs. The legal form of self-government of merchants and craftsmen in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was in essence that of Magdeburg. This law permitted the towns to manage trade and crafts by themselves. It was universal and sanctioned various kinds of legal and economic relations, the activity of the local authorities, the court, its competence and procedures, matters of land ownership in the town or settlement, violations of a holding, seizure of immovable property, established punishments imposed for different crimes, etc. Of special importance were those norms which regulated trade and crafts, the activities of workshops and merchants' partnerships, and the procedures of taxation. Workshops of craftsmen started to be created in Vilnius at the end of the 15th century. In 1495, on the eve of St. Balthasar Day, Grand Duke of Lithuania Alexander approved the status of the first workshop in Vilnius. Goldsmith decided to unite in this union of craftsmen. On St. Balthasar's Day, main ceremonies of workshops and election of the authorities were held. Workshops survived in the capital until 1893, perhaps for the longest time in Europe. They dictated the rhythm of urban life for 400 years. In its original meaning, a workshop is not a craft workshop. This is an organization of craftsmen that emerged in the Middle Ages and whose activity was developed in accordance with a strictly established procedure. Craftsmen rallied into workshops to protect their independence from feudal lords and merchants, to win the right to take part in administration of towns, to preserve the monopoly of products and services in the market of the town, to protect themselves against competition of foreigners, etc. The organizational structure of workshops became inseparably rooted in the governance of towns. First of all, workshops gained power in the magistrates where wealthy merchants had prevailed prior to the development of workshops. Workshops had an even greater influence on bench courts. Workshops managed to achieve that two out of four city treasurers are elected namely by them. A special college was made of the representatives of workshops, which controlled the activities of the magistrate. It was called 60 men in Vilnius and 12 men in Kolnas. The rights of workshops and duties of their members were registered in the statutes prepared in accordance with the model of the cities of Central Europe. At first, the Grand Duke approved them and starting from 1552, they had merely to be registered with at Vilnius Town Hall in the books of the magistrate. Local townspeople or the impoverished nobility formed the largest part of craftsmen it was prohibited to admit peasants to workshops. Soon after the workshop of goldsmith had appeared, there emerged workshops of tailors and dressmakers, blacksmiths, locksmiths and coppersmiths, leather workers, shoemakers, furriers, hatters, saddle harness makers, weavers, joiners, bricklayers, carpenters, founders, malt makers, beer brewers, butchers, salt mongers, surgeons, barbers, etc. At the beginning of the 17th century, 25 workshops, in which masters of as many as 44 specialities worked, functioned in Vilnius. Somewhat later, fishermen, potters, coppers, wheelwrights, bookbinders, whitesmiths, and other craftsmen rallied into workshops. In 1795, there were 38 workshops in Vilnius, which employed 860 masters, 310 apprentices, and 420 learners. From 1811, workshops had to follow Russian statutes of crafts and other acts. 
In the middle of the 19th century, the number of workshops increased to 62, and there were about 2,000 masters there. Workshops of tailors and dressmakers, bakers, leather makers, blacksmiths, joiners, potters, glaziers, chimney sweepers were most abundant in number. Workshops were forming in other towns of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania as well, in Kauna, Skedaini, Mirkini, Rasaini, Shiulei, Telshi, Brasta, Lutsk. Statutes guaranteed equality of rights of the masters irrespective of their nationality or creed. It was even underlined that from three seniors being elected, one had to be a German or a person of another nationality or a person belonging to a Christian faith. The seniors were elected for one year. General meetings were convened each quarter of the year during the greatest holidays, and masters gathered to discuss matters every four weeks. In the event someone failed to attend meetings for a year or six weeks, he was expelled from the members of the workshop. This was the severest punishment of the workshop brothers. This is the name that masters used to call one another. The workshop court, in which one of the chief masters was a judge, handled court cases relating to industrial issues and interrelations between members of the workshop. The procedure of meetings was also interesting. Meetings started as follows. At one o'clock, a small chest of the workshop and a clock were put on the table. One hour was allocated for the members to gather, greet one another, exchange some words, etc. At two o'clock sharp, all the masters sat down at the table according to the year of joining the workshop. Then the small chest was opened and the royal privilege of the workshop was taken out. He who was late or came with a gun had to pay a fine, one quarter of the stone wax. After discussing the issues at hand, the masters usually were treated to beer or mead. Of course, they did so moderately, as befitted respectful townspeople. Every workshop had its own brewery, most often located next to the house, in which the workshop's meetings took place. Money of the workshop was kept in the small chest locked under three locks. Each senior had a key to the chest. First and foremost, the contributions of the members of the workshop were used to buy weapons, and fines were also collected. In the event of the danger of war, craftsmen had to take up a position with muskets and cold weapons on the city wall. Besides, they kept guard at the magistrate and the gates of the town. Every workshop had to have a gun. Starting from 1674, military training of workshops took place in Vilnius every year. The site for them was allocated near the church of St. Stephen, and reviews were held near the town hall. And the most pleasant duty of the workshops was to participate in festive marches to welcome the king, other famous statesmen, and hierarchs of the church. With polished arms, with unfurled banners of workshops, with drums and trumpets, workshop members would compete among themselves to put up the best show. They formed the procession strictly in accordance with the year of the establishment of the workshop. Cecho maestras talkinamas pamestriu. Visa dirbinino pradžios iki pabaigos daryto pats. Nei darbo pasidėjo. The masters of the workshops, assisted by their apprentices, used to make their products from beginning to end themselves. There was neither division of labor nor narrow specialization. Therefore, it was necessary to acquire wide experience. First of all, one had to be a learner for three to four years. One had to pay for tuition, even for putting his name on the list. In the event the youth could not endure offenses and ran away, or change the master, he had to start his apprenticeship anew. The life of an apprentice was not easy. He had to work with the master for three years, and then leave for other towns for a period of another three years to become acquainted with the novelties of his craft. True, he was already paid for his work at that stage. However, he had to deduct a contribution to the workshop's account from his wages and gradually buy all the tools for himself. For any offense against the rules of the workshop, he was severely punished by the master. For coming to work with a hangover, he had to pay the fine of one golden coin, oxina, and for oversleeping on Monday, a three-week payment used to be deducted. In addition, working for a craftsman who did not belong to the workshop and who was derisively called Purchus was an especially great sin, for which it was even worth turning an apprentice out of the workshop. 
Seeking to protect themselves from the self-will of masters, apprentices establish their own unions, gospodas. Apprentices, like masters of workshops, gathered every four weeks to discuss their troubles. The elected seniors headed these gatherings too, and the statute strictly demanded that the young should behave modestly, not to lean with their elbows on the table, not to swing their legs, not to spill beer. Upon completing the training and having returned from a journey, the apprentice could ask the authorities to be permitted to perform a probation work, called Shedevrukas, a small masterpiece. If it was a success, the apprentice had to become a citizen of the town, to pay the workshop the admission fee and treat the masters. In order to become a town dweller enjoying full rights, the apprentice had to acquire a dwelling to pay the magistrate all the due taxes and to arrive armed at the town hall to take an oath. After being accepted to the ranks of masters, he had for another year to serve elder brothers during the meetings by lighting candle at the workshop's altar in the church. In the long run, the number of requirements to obtain the name of a master increased. Workshops tried not to allow strangers to join their workshops. The master's son was another thing. According to the statute, he enjoyed great concessions. His journey was shorter and the admission fee was lower. He who married the master's widow could easily become a member of the workshop. Workshops competed among themselves for the right to arrange the house for general meetings. Historians of Vilnius know the addresses of some workshops. Beer brewers used to gather at 4 Wokichi Street, goldsmiths at 6 Gaon Street, tailors and dressmakers at 24 De Joy Street and 1 Bokshta Street, butchers at 6 Mesinu Street, etc. However, only the house of the workshops of weavers at 13 Rudininku Street has retained the unchanged structure and even excellent murals in the hall of meetings of the 15th century. Lietuvos pirklių saivaldos formos kiek įtokios, tačiau ir jos įprastos Europai, tai gildijos. The forms of self-government of Lithuanian merchants are somewhat different. However, they are also common to all Europe. They are guilds, associations of merchants, which emerged in the 11th and 12th century in Western Europe. At first, the guilds were created for the purpose of mutual assistance and armed self-defense, and later they served the purpose of maintaining the trade monopoly, acquiring privileges of the rulers, etc. In the second half of the 13th century, guilds of German merchants, whose center was in Gothland Bisbee, created the Hanseian League. It united the towns of the southern coast of the Baltic Sea for trade relations between the countries of Western and Eastern Europe. In the second half of the 14th century and in early 15th century, this league became a strong political and military force uniting over 100 cities. Gdańsk, Königsberg and Riga of the Hanseatic League maintained close relations with Lithuania. Its representatives were in Vilnius, Kaunas and other towns of Lithuania. At the end of the 14th century, Riga merchants established their office in Polotsk, and in the middle of the 15th century, the merchants of Gdańsk established their office in Kaunas. Foreign merchants settled themselves in separate blocks in Lithuanian towns. Streets called Rusu, Russian, and Vokichu, German, appeared in Vilnius. The first associations of merchants in Lithuania were brotherhoods of merchants of different branches of trade. Due to the very well-organized German trade, they were slow to emerge. They first appeared in Kaunas in 1398 and then in Klaipeda in 1598. A joint organization of merchants formed in Vilnius only in 1602. It had its own statute and its activities were run by the House of Merchants. In the capital the merchants had their house in the town hall square in the current museum of Vernalis. In Russia, merchant corporations were organized in a different way. They were referred to as Svetche guests or Pirklu Shintinis, merchants hundreds. Guilds emerged there only in the 18th century and signified the property status. Until 1775, the Russian estate of merchants was divided into three guilds by capital and as of 1864 into two guilds. By 1468, Vilnius townspeople gained the right to mediate and trade among foreign traders. In 1511, Sigismund the Old approved this right. Barishniki or intermediaries brought together the merchants who carried their goods to Vilnius and provided the wholesalers with advice. The residents of Vilnius had the privilege of the ruler permitting them to build guest houses named after the merchants of Moscow. Attempts were made to have Sankrovos or warehousing law However, the collectors of duties objected against it. 
Trade restrictions were not in force at the fairs, however. In 1441, ruler Casimir granted Vilnius the right to hold two fairs lasting eight days each year, one after the Epiphany and the other after the Rolene, the day of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin.